Yeah, Francesca Pazmer, what <clears throat> we were, I was going to write a book, what not to do when hosting, and Francesca was going to write it. Oh, uh, she show up smacking gum. Sometimes she'd be do aerobics during the webcast. Always chewing gum. <clears throat> hi, Mikolaj, can you hear me? Hi, hi. I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, uh, you know, dear John, uh, here is uh, Mikulaj. He's uh, an organizer, of course. Okay. Um, uh, he's from Poland, by the way. Hello, it's nice to meet you.
Hi, Jayan. Can you, can you hear me? I should do it. Can I give it to you? I give it to you. Jayan, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, you know, there we have uh, another organizer called uh, Jayan Her. I, I think so. so that's and okay. You don't have to let me know who the organizers are. That's okay. Yeah, okay. That's okay. I see you, Francesca.
Halo. Hai. Hai, bro. Can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Now I can hear. Maybe we can try the share screening um, before the um, start of the event to make sure that everything is okay. Professor Adnan? Yes. Is, uh, can you please uh, share your screen and your presentation to make sure that everything is okay and it works? Okay. Okay, we can see the presentation now and um, on uh, presentation mode, maybe to see if that works too. It works. Is it clear? Yes, it's very clear. Thank you so much. And thank you for accepting our invitation. It's a real honor. You're more than welcome.
Good evening, everybody, or good afternoon. Let's see here. Hi, John. Uh, is that a man? Oh, Dr. Oh, Adnan, how are you doing, Adnan? Adnan? Doctor, I haven't seen you for a while. Yes, yes. So you're from uh, you're from Yemen, right? Yes. Okay. It's quite an ambitious project today. Yes, yes, a very nice project. The other speaker doesn't didn't come yet. Yes. Hey, welcome, everybody. It is uh, if you need to be admitted from the panel, just give me a holler. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to recognize uh, other organizers, John? Who else we got? Mm -hmm. Oh, Jun Hor. Jun Hor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Asha, I'll make you part of, of the inner circle here. Come into the lounge, Harshad. Uh, so we got anybody missing here? Uh, oh, there's Nick. Welcome, Nick. Marianne De Deraj. If anybody wants to come in, just. Uh, Madalena, Elena, your camera's not on. Uh, if you could please advise the people that are part of administration to turn their camera Sorry, I on. Probably, I think, I don't know if that is a problem. I, I think generally, maybe I'm too strict, but I think uh, generally in a webcast, you should have the panelists and the people involved in the and platform to be on camera and not dark mm. silence. Mm. You know, I can see if you're just watching watching it. I understand, but if you're part mm. of the of the program of the, you know, put your camera on so we can see you. Yes, yeah, that's good. You're right. Uh, by the way, I talked with uh, Professor Salman Sharif and asked him when will he join us. He just talked to me. It's a few minutes of that. He, he's and, an old pro. He'll come probably at one minute before. Yeah, he's always doing that. No, he's he, he does a lot of these, so he he, he knows. Yeah. He, he, he knows. It's not new. Yeah. It was pretty ambitious, uh, Ahmad. More than usual. Alexandra Bodog, how you doing? Good, thank you. Are you uh, you're part of the Dandy organization? Yes, I'm part of Dandy Romania. Today I will do the introduction instead of Madalina. Okay, okay, yeah. Romania, Romania, right? Yes, Romania. Okay, okay. Hi, Alexandra, how are you? 
Hello, good. Uh, it's very good to her. I mean, I'm very glad to see her with us. Thank you. Okay. Anybody we're missing there in the panel? Uh, or Okay. Oh, Darius Latka, he's a talker, right? He's a speaker, Darius Latka. I believe he's from Poland, correct? You know, someone was at Darius, is Darius there? Oh, hello, hello, can you hear me? Darius, how you don't know we can't? We see your uh, that's something else, an image. We don't see you. Okay. You're, you're screen sharing probably. We're seeing another screen. We're not seeing your picture. Hello, Professor. Welcome, Mikol Mikolaj. Is Darius going first? Uh, yes, I would. I would like to be first because I'm I'm driving now and I've got a, my a grandson on a board, you know, and it is oh, heavy okay. snow that here in north, north of Poland. Okay, that makes sense to me, but it's up to Ahmad. 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 Okay, well, Ahmed, Ahmed, that's okay, right? Darius wants to go first. Okay. For the reasons that he delayed. Yeah, we we connected with Ahmed and he agreed to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Roxander, have you talked with uh, with the Romania speaker? Uh, no, I didn't. I think Madalina talked with him. Let me just text her. Yeah, I'll um, I'll contact him right now. Oh, good. Are you able to see my my my, my uh, slide? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Do you have any videos? Yes, I have. Uh, but, but go. first, but, if you're going to play them, we need to go see them now. Okay. To make sure that they're working okay. Do you have audio in the, in the uh, videos or no? Yes, it's 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 everything, I suppose. Okay, you have to turn the audio on. You can't hear the audio, right? You have the audio on now? Yeah. Okay, if you want the audio to play, we're going to test it. Okay. No, I haven't got any. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, most people don't. So that's all right. Now you're a resident, Ahmed, right? Not yet, not yet. Uh, I'm sorry? Not yet. I mean, in the last year before the internship. Okay, so you're a resident or? No, no, medical student, but in the last year, and then we will have uh, uh, an internship um, one year, you know, after the medical school. Okay, so you're the first year? No, last year of the medical school. 
Okay, last year of medical school? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, okay. So I just want to introduce you. I introduce you first, right? Okay, as Rish. But yeah, you know, uh, once, I mean, uh, as the uh, professor here at Drazios, I think, um, he will be introduced by, uh, you know, the Romanian. Uh, okay. Do you mind if I introduce you first and you run it, basically? Mm -hmm. uh, I want you to be like a quarterback, you know, like running it. Okay? Yeah. It's that means... I mean, yeah, it's, best, it's best that you do that, okay? Or someone okay. do that. Okay, you will introduce uh, me, then I'm going to introduce the Roxandra, and then Roxandra will introduce... Uh... No, no, I'm going to introduce you. I'm going to introduce you first. Okay. <clears throat> That's... And, then you, and then you run the, the broadcast, essentially, because I don't know how you have it structured, but you know how you want it structured, so... You kind of run the run the your quarterback, basically. Yeah, yeah. By the way, we scheduled everything. Don't worry. Okay, mm -hmm. you, ready, you ready to start, everybody? You ready to start, Ahmed? Yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Kachinaj just uh, joined us. If you can uh, put him in the panelists list. Uh, What's the I... name? What's the name? Uh, Dr. Kretchenash, uh, C R U. Sorry, sorry, I did, I did. Just a minute. Okay, you have to, you have to spell it. You have to write it out, please, and send it in the chat. Okay, I, I just. Write okay, it'll be easy to understand that. It's. Oh, cool. Okay, Crassionis, Crassionis, okay. Yeah. Crassionis, okay. I never would have guessed that spelling. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't, do you see here on the panel? Do you see that on the panel? Uh, I don't no, see it. I don't see a. This is still one of the attendees right now. You know, I don't, I don't uh, see her. I tried to. Oh, he's at the S. Look for S O R I. I don't see it spelled. Oh, Soren. Okay, Soren. Okay. Yeah. See, maybe that will help find it. Do you see it? Yes. Oh, there we go. Okay. Attendees. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. He's one of our So she's fans. in. Yeah. Okay. Okay, yeah. here we go. I'm at ready. Wait, wait a minute. I'm just talking with Professor Salman. Just a minute. Okay. You wanna join us? Okay. Just a minute. Hello, good evening, everyone. Good day, Soren. Dr. Bennett. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. You're a presenter today, right? Yeah. Okay, very good. We ready, Ahmed? I'm just with Professor Salman. He wanna join us and he's right waiting in the room. So I can see him. Uh, okay, let's start then, okay? He's there, just a minute, dear. Is that okay to start now? Mm -hmm. We can't wait for everybody to come in. We They'll come in as we go along, okay? Hi, how are you? Hi John, good to see you. Hey, how, um, how are you doing? Is this Salman? Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Ahmed has a very ambitious program laid out here. <laughs> Always has. And, and you know what it's like uh, to organize. So I know. <laughs> so it's not it's not easy. I totally agree. How is everybody? Hi, Professor Salman. I'm really happy to see her there. It's my pleasure. It's really always a pleasure to join you guys. Okay, thank here you we so go. much. Here we go, Ahmed. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Two, one. 
Good afternoon from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett of Neurosurgical TV. A great, great honor to host uh, uh, a group of three Walter Dandy communities, um, Romania, Yemen, and Poland, together to put an all-star webcast of speakers. And I'll let Ahmed al Nami uh, moderate. He's a very ambitious guy. He loves uh, he loves this platform for teaching and uh, take it away, um, uh, Ahmed. Hi, dear uh, John. Thank you, thank you dear. Uh, first of all, let me invest this moment to, uh, to thank uh, dear John for this uh, opportunity. And also to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, Professor Salman Sharif, Professor Adnan and other speakers. Uh, <clears throat> a bit of, by the way, I would like to introduce myself. I is Ahmed Al-Ghanimi. I am the president of Walter Reed and the Neurosurgical Center in Calabar, Yemen. I'm also a marketing administrator at Abdul Rauf University of Neurosurgery, which is considered the first online academic degree in neurosurgery worldwide. Uh, now, if you permit me, I'm going to give mic to my colleague, uh, Roxandra from Romania, to introduce Romanian uh, neurosurgery. Hi, Roxandra. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, I could hear, but I believe our studio is supposed to begin with Darius Latka from Poland. And he shall be introduced by uh, someone from the indeed Poland, I believe. Yeah, you can introduce him, please. Uh, I think the person that was supposed to introduce him had a speech prepared. Oh, yeah, I'll go. Okay. Uh Good evening, everyone. So I'm the president from the Walter E. Dandy Poland Neurosurgical Society. It's my great pleasure to introduce our professor, Dariusz Wonka from Poland, uh, working in the neurosurgery department in the University Hospital of Opole. Uh, he'll be presenting about the novel multidisciplinary approach, surgical separation and percutaneous carbon screws as an introduction for the steroradiotherapy in spinal metastasis. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello to everybody. Uh, good evening. My name is Darius Latka. It's a great honor for me to represent Opole Poland, a neurosurgery at this symposium. Uh, I'm a chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Opole and the president of Polish Spine Surgery Society as well and chairman of Dendi Polish chapter. So it's a great honor to, for me to, to, to join. Uh, first of all, sorry that I asked to be first. Uh, I, I am in a very long journey. I hope to reach my destination earlier, but the road conditions are very heavy in north of Poland now. It's heavy snowing, so sorry for that. And I've got uh, uh, my grandson and my dog uh, on board. Uh, today, I would like to present you uh, our idea for tumor separation in order to pre prepare a patient with metastatic disease of the spine for modern stereoradiotherapy. Uh, forgive me uh, in advance that my presentation will uh, contain a little bit of uh, product placement but uh, without relationships bet between industry and doctors, it's difficult to imagine the progress of medicine now. So um, I hope you will forgive me, especially that I will not even mention the name of the product, only its uh, unique features, okay? Uh, bone metastases are common in neoplastic disease. Mm, they, as you know, uh, affect almost 70% of patients uh, treated for malignant tumors. In 40% of them, uh, they are located in the spine. About 70% uh, of spine meds are located in the thoracic spine and 9% in the cervical spine. In both these locations, we have a spinal cord what means that we can expect not only pain, but also serious uh, neurological uh, problems. Uh, in the past decades, pre-MRI times, when I'm starting my neurosurgical career, uh, very often the first symptoms of spinal meds was paraparesis. Patients were diagnosed with myelography, as you can see here. Uh, it was the standard in diagnostic in these times. We used to do 
the, the compression on the level of so-called contrast stop. Uh, so the treatment consists of a decompression laminectomy, sometimes internal instrumentation. Uh, then the patient used to underwent radiation therapy uh, of a spine axis. Uh, the presence of important neurological structures in the irradiation field limited the dose. So the effectiveness of this treatment um, was, uh, was and, and is low till nowadays. Many things has changed since that time. First of all, diagnostics became precise and easily accessible. We can see patients much earlier and of course in better neurological conditions. There is also something very new uh, with radiotherapy. Stereo radio surgery era began. What's this? It is the uh, irradiation of the computer-defined area of the spine. Uh, so uh, uh, the cancer cells could be uh, killed with it, killed to death. It's a kind of removal, but without uh, all the risk associated with extensive surgical procedures, uh, such as vertebrectomy. Uh, it turns out that the effectiveness of stereo radio surgery is similar uh, to that observed after marginal resections, even in tumors that are not uh, radiosensitive. We can uh, sometimes achieve even 90% of local control and 96% per percent of pain reduction in uh, three years follow-ups. Because modern oncology provides a lot of treatment options that include systemic treatment, radiation, and many surgical options. So the proper treatment requires the cooperation between doctors from different specialties, neurologists, spinal surgeon, general oncologist, radiotherapist. Uh, this uh, multidisciplinary team is able to plan the best treatment option basing on so-called NOMS paradigm. NOMS, you, you can see NOMS, neurologic, oncologic, mechanical, and systemic, uh, provides a decision framework. It is the algorithm in treatment of spinal meds. We have to consider the tumor sensitivity to radiation in conjunction with, in conjunction with uh, epidural extensions. We have to determine the optimal radiation treatment and the need for surgical decompression. We also have uh, to determine mechanical stability of the spine and the patient's systemic state, which also helps us to determine the need and the kind of surgical intervention. The latest reports in the literature indicate that stereo radiotherapy provides a permanent local control of spine meds, especially if we create surgically good conditions for it. For instance, we can surgically make an effective tumor separation. What does it mean, separation? Uh, in order to be able to irradiate a defined area with a large dose uh, and save important adjacent areas, we don't need to perform large resections. It's enough to separate important structures, creating a space of about one, two millimeters around the, around the uh, spine. This is, the, uh, this is uh, what does the separation uh, surgery means. So it is a kind of new paradigm of surgical management of spine meds. It is, I suppose, a game changer for local disease control. Uh, when separating the tumor, it is often, often necessary to, to use stabilizing implants because spinal meds patient can suffer from instability. An assessment of spinal instability 
is an essential component of decision making in spine surgery. Uh, the SIN scale, you can see it on this slide, uh, could be employed in um, uh, determining the, the, the need for spine sp stabilization, even for simple first contact doctor or, or general oncologist. So they can, uh, they can decide to, to transfer a patient to the spinal surgeon if they, uh, if they found that, that it is uh, unstable or potentially unstable. We used to use uh, titanium implants in case of NIMS scores over seven. Uh, these implants have one disadvantage. They give artifacts in radiology exams, and uh, this make very difficult to plan modern stereoradiotherapy. Uh, just uh, have a look at these badly artifacts uh, on this uh, on these pictures. And attention, please, because this slide contains product placement. Uh, there are some implants without these disadvantages. They have already appeared on the market. Uh, these implants are carbon peak. Uh, mm, they have mechanical strength, very comparable to titanium implants, but the, they look uh, much better on, on uh, pictures. In these pictures, you can see a comparison of artifacts in X-ray, MRI and CT scans of one patient, traditional screws on the left, and carbon peak on the right. Uh, this material, I mean a carbon peak, turns out to be so attractive that it allowed to create a very wide portfolio of products completely sufficient to supply the neoplastic spine. Uh, the only disadvantage seems to be, of course, the price. Here you have the example of our own patient, lumbar separation and uh, open carbon peak fusion. <clears throat> Sorry, you can see that there are no artifacts in the area of interest when the, when the uh, radio surgeon, so-called radio surgeon um, uh, is planning his so-called surgery, there is nothing uh, to disturb him. Another own case of tumor removal and carboc peak cervical spondylodesis. You can hardly see these dotted, this dotted points, radiological markers. Uh, it turns out that carbon peak implants not only give less artifacts giving precise treatment planning, but also mm, I think it is uh, above all importance. They've got minimal impact of the uh, distribution of dose in stereoradiotherapy. Each implant <clears throat> partially reflects the radiation beam causing an overdose in front of the implant and the weakening of the dose behind the implant. This picture shows that this effect with carbon implants in many, is many times smaller than uh, with titanium. Uh, the potential benefit of use of these implants are not only available at the stage of planning uh, of radiotherapy, and during radiotherapy, as you can see in these pictures, but also in the follow-ups towards possible recurrences. It is very, very important. Uh, open separation, so a separation in open big surgery is simple and effective, but it should be <clears throat> underlined that some patients with advanced cancer may not be able to tolerate uh, even such small invasive pro procedures like uh, open separation. Therefore, the question arises 
uh, whether the creation of the space around the medulla can be achieved very minimally invasively. For instance, endoscopically, you know, endospinal endoscopy, it is something very, very, uh, very nice, especially in degenerative cases. Uh, uh, now in Poland, all spinal surgeons uh, become crazy about spinal endoscopy. So why not to, to try to use it in, uh, in oncology patients? In theory, it should be okay. The endoscopic procedure involves uh, moving through the epidural space. So we have to create this space around the medulla. And indeed, the uh, uh, idea of using this technology in cancer disease have already been described in the literature, uh, but there are uh, very few reports of this. Uh, so I can, uh, I can say that our early experience here in Opole in Poland uh, is in fact uh, innovative. Controversial, but, but, in, but, but innovative. So far, it covers two patients. This is one of them. They are ra radiologic pictures before and after surgery. <clears throat> and this is how it looks like interoperatively. So you can probably say that both the radio image effects and the intraoperative effects are okay. Separation procedures uh, can be bloody in, in open manner, but in both our cases, we did uh, not encounter any uh, such problems in endoscopy. We work under hemostatic fluid pressure regulated uh, in the event of heavy bleeding. Um, we also have in endoscopy quite effective electrocoagulation, so there are no such uh, problems. Conclusion, this is the option. We have to try it, at least in some cases. So we, we encourage uh, everybody. Uh, at least, but not, uh, I would like to invite all of you to come to Poland to attend 9th Polish Spine Surgery Congress to be held in Opole next week. Opole is a beautiful historic city in southwest of Poland. It is a city known as the capital of Polish song because of a festival held here annually. Unfortunately, not, not in November, but believe me, drinking Polish vodka is easier in autumn than in summer. So thank you for your attention. If any questions, I'm, I, I'm ready to answer. Hi, sir. I have one question for you. Uh, yeah. If there is a, a, a spine metastasic disease with the, uh, diffuse metastasis uh, all over the chest, abdomen, in a very bad case, is it uh, legable for uh, your separation for uh, radio surgery intervention or? Uh, one more time. I, I, I can't understand you. Is it important to use internal uh, stabilization in cases of uh, patients uh, with with spinal instability caused by the meds? Yeah, spinal instability or diffuse metastasis. Ah, and diffuse metastasis. Yes. Yes. But, but they are no probable for 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 stereo radio surgery, so it doesn't matter. If there is a possibility to put the instrumentation in, we do it. But 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 it does but, but but it does not disturb the, the radio surgeon to to plan his uh, stereo radiotherapy because usually he used to to irradiate the whole spine axis. Okay, thank you.
Okay, Ahmed, what would you like to do? Now, okay, first of all, I would like to thank Professor for this insightful uh, presentation. <clears throat> and uh, I hope so to have uh, his success with us. Um, I mean, maybe uh, more, more time. Uh, now I would like to to get uh, the mic to uh, uh, to my college, uh, Mikolaj from uh, um, from Poland, in order to introduce Professor Salman Sharif. First of all, I want to also thank uh, Professor Darius Wodka. Uh, thank you that you could join us here, and thank you for your insightful uh, presentation. Uh, even in those hard times, it's your journey. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next presenter uh, will be Professor Salman Sharif. Uh, he is a chairman of World Federation as Spine Committee, and uh, he will present uh, about spinal metastasis uh, prediction of outcome. Thank you very much, Professor, for uh, being here with us. You are muted, Professor. We can't hear you. OK. Um, sorry about that. Um, I think um, uh, I'm grateful to Professor Lachka for giving this wonderful talk and already covering majority of the points that I was going to make. But um, overall, it's good revision. And I think uh, I was going to just give a talk on evolution, spinal metastasis, and how we can predict prognosis and decide which patients would you operate and which patients we won't. Again, I'd like to thank John and Ahmed and um, all the three societies who are contributing today and taking part in trying to learn something out of um, some interesting topics from excellent speakers. Well, this is Pakistan. You guys are most welcome. As I uh, told you guys before as well, that out of the top 10 peaks in the world, six are in Pakistan, which means all the uh, peaks which are above uh, 6,000 meters, majority of them are in Pakistan. It's a wonderful northern areas that we have. Well, bone is the third most frequent metastatic site of distant spread of carcinoma. Classic primary sites are breast, lungs, prostate, uh, kidneys, and thyroid. Vertebral column is the most common site of skeleton metastasis. 10% of patients with metastatic disease will develop spinal mets, and one third will become symptomatic. So we know this in background. About 2.5% will develop some kind of cord compression, and dorsal spine is the most common involved. This is a, a paper that we wrote ages ago, eight years ago, on um, spinal metastasis. Uh, spinal cord compression is expected in up to 20%, with 95% having an epidural metastasis, and um, 5% will present with intradural, and very rarely that you see intramedullary metastasis. So causes of neurological deficits, uh, direct compression, as you can see here, that compression going out and pressing on the cord, or a collapse of the vertebral body, and that's going into it. Vascular incompetence ischemia or uh, venous congestion because of pressure and instability, movement because of kyphotic deformity or spinal malalignment. Um, well, Loff Loffler came up with uh, this idea that optimum clinical management of these patients require integrated decision by an interdisciplinary cancer team. And that's what everybody has done. Medical and radiation oncologists, fine surgeons, other healthcare professional rehab, other um, people who are involved all come into play. Um, uh, psychiatrists, um, psychologists, and they all help us in treating these patients. Workup, we generally use NICE guidelines and spinal metastasis by the Dutch National Working Group on Neuro Oncology. So we have a CT, MRI, FDG, PET. That's the minimum that we do for our patients. And decision-making is tough because there's urgency to prevent paralysis when the cord is being squashed. On the other hand, you have the potential of post-surgical morbidity in a weak patient with limited life expectancy. So dilemma and decision-making are all these factors that are shown here, tumor load, life expectancy, pathology of the patient, which is very important because our prognosis depend on that, functional status, are they able to walk or not, 
neurology, age, comorbidities, bone quality, instability, progression of disease, and the treatment options available. So there is a quantity and quality of life. So you have a person who's alive and well, and you could have a person who could be alive and miserable. So if somebody has got survival less than six months, would you offer them surgery or not? That's a big question. That depends on what kind of outcome you can give them. So prognostic factors are functional status, number of visceral metastases, primary tumor pathology, and age. And we know that, for example, if we see a patient like this who's got metastases all over the place, then obviously this, this patient, you are not going to be um, doing heroics here. So direct compression, uh, surgical resection in the treatment of spinal cord by um, metastatic cancer. This is one of the famous uh, and most commonly quoted paper by Roy Petchel, in which they compared uh, direct decompressive surgery uh, plus post-operative radiotherapy to radiotherapy alone and showed a clear difference in outcome. And this actually study, which was a randomized control study, was stopped uh, halfway because there were too much of a difference. So you can see if you, this was published in Lancet, and clearly if you had um, a patient who had surgery plus radiotherapy, the outcome was completely different to somebody who only had radiotherapy at that time. So uh, this is the ambulatory after treatment, and we can see the difference between the two. Um, solid tumors with high-grade epidural spinal cord compression. So this is the difference between the two. Surgery, 84%, whereas uh, radiation alone, 57%. Um, if you see here, duration when they were lived after surgery was 122 days to radiation, 13 days, recover after ambulation, 62%. Continence, 155 days versus 17 days. Narcotics, much less. Survival uh, time, 126 days to 100 days. And you can see continence and narcotics are severely um, uh, significant when you compared radiotherapy versus surgery plus radiotherapy. So uh, short-term survival, we look at age, Karnofsky's performance scale. Um, on the other hand, there's long-term survival, survival, which depends on tumor histology and vertebral levels involved. So palliative surgery, goals of the um, therapy is neurological function, surgical stability, pain control, and local tumor control if possible with radiation and external beam or SRS as shown earlier. So options of therapy, it's a multidisciplinary approach. So systemic therapy is chemo, immuno, hormonal therapy or targeted therapy, and more and more targeted therapies coming on in which we are able to take out um, the tumor and find out what kind of um, uh, targets we can um, uh, uh, hit, and then we can make specific medicines specially targeting that specific cells. Radiation therapy, we already have been talked about. Surgery, you could, you could have a percutaneous cement augmentation. You could do an open, in-block, intralesional or separation surgery as shown earlier. So this uh, framework by Lawfer back in 2013 uh, talked about um, aims to simplify treatment by basing on four fundamental consideration. What was the patient's neurology? What was the patient's oncology? What was there mechanical instability or systemic disease? So for example, if you had a patient like this who, have, who was myelopathic, um, depending on functional radiculopathy, epidural spinal cord compression, what kind of histology that would be that would decide that how the patient's outcome is going to be. Mechanical instability for us to decide that gives you pain as well as it can then tell us what exactly we need to do. Do we need to operate or not operate? And there's a score that we follow. And there's systemic disease and mechanical uh, medical comorbidities. So way back in 2009, all these tumors were supposed to be unfavorable for radiation. And so what we used to do, we used to be thinking more in line of so operating on these patients, thinking that these are unfavorable, both for radiotherapy. And um, so they were not radiosensitive, whereas the favorable ones were lymphoma, breast, prostate. But nowadays, more and more tumors can be managed with the help of uh, stereotactic radiosurgery. So Bilski's uh, reliability analysis of epidural spinal cord compression, so he came up with uh, how much of compression there is, and they divided that into one, two, and three, one in which there's tumor is extending into the epidural space without deformation of the spinal cord. 1A was impingement with no deformation, 1B was deformation, uh, but without spinal cord abutment, and 1C was a thecal uh, sac was deformed uh, with spinal cord abutment, but without compression. 
And then there was spinal cord compression, but no CSF visible, and then no CSF visible. And depending on that, decided how aggressive or how much of uh, therapy is required or surgery is required or not. So if there was a small uh, epidural compression that could be knocked off by radiotherapy, if the compression was very high, then needed surgery for the same. And this uh, has been a routine for our follow-up. So somebody who's got radiosensitive tumor, you can just give them radiotherapy and they're going to disappear uh, with the help of that. So neurological assessment is critical because um, what we could do is we could, could um, uh, with a high-grade epidural spinal cord compression, safe delivery of SRS can give very good outcome. So most commonly SRS used is restricted to tumors confined to bone or to minimal epidural impingement. So this was the case initially until 2010, but now more and more cases can be done with the help of stereotactic radiosurgery. And that's why separation surgery came into play. So that is to decompress the spinal cord in order to reconstitute the spinal fluid space in and around and to make sure that you do not put any kind of instrumentation just like the carbon one showed earlier. So it provides a safe margin to deliver a cytotoxic radiation dose to the tumor without the constraints of spinal cord toleration. So basically we are operating and we debulk as much as tumor as possible, but basically we separate the tumor from the normal tissue itself, so from cord, so that when you're giving radiotherapy, it doesn't cause problems to um, the patient in the long run. So separation surgery is like that. You can do a minimally invasive screw fixation at the same time, minimally invasive decompression, and then you can give radiotherapy for same. So a 38-year-old with the differential liposarcoma and separation surgery was done. This was an open procedure. And uh, then you look at if it was mechanically unstable, then obviously you have to go and fuse as well. So the assessment number three, mechanical stability, we looked at it, look at it with a spinal instability neoplastic scale. This is the scale we use to decide are we going to operate or not because of instability. So radio, all the oncologists would refer patients to us asking us, what do we think? Does this patient need surgery or not? And this is an excellent score. How it works is it looks at the where exactly is it? Is it junctional, mobile, semi-rigid or rigid? Uh, is it causing pain or not? Is it lytic, mixed or plastic? And uh, looking at the alignment, subluxation, translation, de novo or normal. Then how much of vertebral body collapse there is and posterior lateral involvement? And then according to that, we give them score. And we call if the score is 0 to 6 as stable, or potentially unstable is 7 to 12, where we decide according to many other factors instead of this particular factor, and 13 to 18 would be completely unstable. So for example, a patient like this, breast CA, bilateral mastectomy, chemo, neck pain, no other problem. So location is score is one, pain, none, type of lesion is lytic, two, radiographic alignment is zero because the alignment is intact, vertebral body collapse is not there, zero. So the score comes out to be six. So it's a stable patient does, does not need surgery. So it's quite simple. So uh, with SIN score, uh, many studies have been done and shown that it is um, uh, works very, very well uh, if we um, use a SIN score in deciding to operate or not to operate. So for example, this unstable patient uh, with the junction, junctional problem with mechanical pain, with the lytic lesion. And if you look, keep looking at it because of the subluxation and the, uh, no collapse itself and unilateral involvement of the posterior elements, the score goes down to 14. And obviously it needs surgery as we talked about before. So, and now and now more and more percutaneous posterior fixations are done for patients like these uh, with the minimally invasive decompression and then uh, MI screws so that these patients can have earlier radiotherapy instead of delayed radiotherapy. So this norm scales work, works like this, that you've got the low or high grade compression, depending on if you decide what exactly you're gonna do. If the patient has radiosensitive or radiosresistant tumor, we decide accordingly. Is it stable or unstable and is able to tolerate surgery or unable to tolerate surgery? Then comes the Tokohashi score that we use in uh, some of our patients. And this is to evaluate the performance uh, of the Tokahashi score. So time from cancer diagnosis to metastatic diagnosis in CONUS, less than two years, two to five years or more than five years. And this um, score basically shows many ways of um, uh, predicting the outcome in patients. So we looked at uh, different scores and to see if um, uh, can they predict the outcomes. We looked at Tomiti, Tokahashi, modified bore, and SIN scores, which is spinal instability score. 
Tomita described the system based on three factors, primary tumor, visceral, and bony metastasis, Tokuhashi. It has a performance status in it as well, along with neurology and tumor uh, diagnosis. Whereas modified BOR is a very simple scoring system and does not have a specific tumor. So if Tomita, we look at primary tumor, is slow growing, moderately growing, or rapid growth, gives scores according to that. Visceral metastasis, non-treatable uh, or non-treatable, and bony metastasis, solitary, uh, isolated, and multiple. We give score according to that and decide do they need surgery or not. Again, revised to Okohashi. So, so for example, with all these uh, um, factors that run into play, especially looking at general condition, uh, number of metastases in body, extraspinal, mets to internal organs, and we give score accordingly. And if the score is zero to eight, we give conservative treatment at the predicted prognosis is less than six months. If the score is nine to 11, the prognosis is more than six months. And if it's uh, 12 to 15, then it is more than a year. In those patients, obviously, excisional therapy may be recommended. Uh, so this, uh, uh, if you look at specifically the different scoring system that we use, so we can see that again, we give them outcome and it can predict uh, the outcome and sort of how, what kind of prognosis they're going to have in the long run. Modified score was for prediction of metastatic uh, spine tumor prognosis. And this is the advantage of the score is you don't have to have the pathology itself you just need to know that its primary tumor is from breast, kidney, lymphoma, or multiple myeloma, and one solitary skeletal metastasis. And this can specifically tell you, in majority of the cases, what kind of outcome these patients have. And so we looked at all these, and in our study, we found that they, all these factors were very, very important. And Tumita score had the highest statistical significance followed by both. SINS was identified as a predictor of instability, but no association with survival itself. Individual factors like age, preoperative neurology, vertebral levels, visceral metastasis, and Kornowski score showed um, positive correlation. So uh, they are individual factors are very, very important. So basically, in our study, we showed Tumita scores were better compared to the other scores. And the conclusion from that study was the norms integrated modern radiation and surgical options since addresses instability, BOR has better predictability, and separation surgery followed by radiation uh, provides durable tumor control. Um, then prognostic factors in patients with symptomatic spinal metastasis and normal neurological function. So pre-treatment uh, albumin level was a significant prognostic factor of survival. So that's what we look at in the majority of our patients now. So if you look at MIS versus posterior decompression, MIS was much superior. And pathological factors in metastatic spinal compression patients, uh, pain, tumor size within the vertebral body, vertebral end plate, three column involvement, all these were significant factors that showed us the, that these were the risk factors or pathological factors. Patients with osteolytic fractures have got had the same problem. So if you look at different results over time, over the years, which people have shown, so radiotherapy alone, 27% of the patients had a, a reasonable outcome uh, who had radiotherapy alone. Patients with laminectomy and radiotherapy, only 28%, one in four patients improved. If you look at posterior decompression and uh, stabilization, 55% of these patients improved. So what about vertebral body resection and radiotherapy, 62%. But slowly and gradually with time, with separation surgery, along with the stereotactic radiosurgery, we are seeing uh, results up to 88% in the majority of these cases. So slowly and gradually, the whole scenario has changed. And now we can see specific radiosurgery can be very, very good in achieving good results. So a strong recommendation was made by Bilski that high-grade spinal cord compression due to solid tumor malignancy undergo surgical decompression and stabilization followed by radiotherapy. And norms should be also taken into account. From the neurological and oncological perspective, surgery is reserved for patients with radio-resistant tumors who have high-grade spinal cord compression. Surgery is used to uh, preserve or restore neurological function and stabilize the spine. Mechanical instability is an indication of surgical stabilization regardless of the tumor radiosensitive or histology. In block resection, resection could be an option in selected solid patients, but again, stereotactic radiosurgery has taken up a big role, and surgical trend includes less invasive surgery with emphasis on durable local control and spinal stabilization. 
Then now we have come up with an LMNOP framework, um, which was described by Peton in 2011. The mnemonic refers to location and spinal level of the disease, which is L, M is mechanical instability, N is neurology, uh, oncology is O, patient fitness is P, and response to prior therapy is P. So two additional key factors were local location of the spinal level and response to previous therapy if they have had any. And Spinal Oncology Consortium in 2017 decided to evaluate, consolidate, and synthesize a multidisciplinary algorithm, which I'll show here. So for example, if performance status, it's a, it's a poor status, those patients are considered for conservative conventional treatment. If it's fair, then you go on to extent or minimal moderation. Uh, disease control, is it controlled or not? Depending on that, you decide how aggressive you're going to be looking after these patients. So if patient is unstable, obviously you certainly give them surgery. If patient is stable, then you can think about stable spine with mechanical pain. So you can give them braces, do whatever plasty. If it's confined to bone or paraspinal, then radiosensitive sensitive, we give them radiotherapy, SRS. If patient is um, not responding, then obviously in those particular unfavorable patients, surgery could be an option followed by stereotactic radiation. So all the systems over last 10 years have changed. The way we handle uh, metastasis have changed itself as well. So in conclusion, spinal metastasis require a multidisciplinary and multidimensional treatment. With the onset of SRS and concept of separation surgery, the assisted role of radiotherapy and surgery together have significant results. SRS has eliminated the concept of the radio-resistant tumors. There is to no specific algorithm, but LMNOP is widely used as it incorporates uh, previous treatments options, and you take it together and go on to have a look at current condition, primary etiology, and disease spread. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to join us all in November next year in Dublin, where we have the next World Spine. So thank you, uh, it was really my pleasure um, to be joining you here. Thank you, Professor, for this uh, great uh, presentation. And um, again, thank you for a response, for responding for our invitation for this uh, webinar. Uh, I hope to <clears throat> meet you soon and uh, maybe in webinars or uh, in actually, you know, maybe conferences, something like that. So I'm very excited to see you soon. And uh, I hope so if there is anyone want to ask any question. Ahmed, it was my pleasure to be here. It's wonderful to talk to you all. And uh, I wish that we would see us uh, together soon. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Ahmed, you want to introduce the next speaker, please? Yeah. Uh, now, uh, we will go ahead with uh, Prof. Adnan al -Awadi. You know, Prof. Adnan is um, the president of Human Neurosurgeon Chapter and uh, the chairman of the neurosurgery department at uh, at Thora Modern General Hospital at uh, Sana'a, which is the, the largest and the reference hospital around the Yemen. So, Prof, you can go ahead. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. John, for this uh, nice opportunity. Our topic today is uh, a very complicated and uh, important subject of spinal infection uh, and indication for operation uh, intervention in such, care in such cases. Here in our country, we have a big problem about spinal infection, which has uh, nowadays become more and more, especially for uh, TB infection in the spine, which was previously decreased. And during this uh, year's report, uh, a lot of cases were, were presented to us and uh, from different ages, children and adult uh, patients. Until we are classification, uh, classified spinal infection according to uh, host immune response to biogenic versus 
ground glomerulus uh, infection or to an anatomical location uh, either to the vertebral body disc epidural or subdural space or to the region or lumbar or cervical thoracic region uh, infect infectious route or uh, either hematogenous or local extension direct inoculation and uh, either to, uh, it classified uh, according to host uh, age pediatric versus adult we have a risk factor for spinal infection including age young age and elderly age intravenous drug abuser or patient with diabetes or renal failure spinal surgery or trauma patient with uh, immunocompromised rheumatoid arthritis, chronic steroid use, and correct alcoholism with family member or uh, uh, household uh, contact with the tuberculosis inhibition suspected to be uh, about disease. The most uh, frequent route of infection or spread of infection is the, the most common route is the hematogenous, followed by local extension from nearby infection or a direct inoculation. Clinical presentation, a uh, variety of uh, back or neck pain, uh, notice in 90% of patients, fever and neurologic deficit was presented in 17 of patients at presentation, radicular pain, weight loss, and the spinal deformity may be a late presenting finding. A delayed diagnosis uh, is a common with 50% of patients reporting symptoms for more than three months before diagnosis. The common organism for biogenic abscess is staphylococcus and uh, gram-negative organism uh, in the intravenous drug users. Uh, we can see uh, pseudomonas, anaerobic and aerobic infection in a diabetic uh, patients. Spinal tuberculosis uh, common in endemic area and can be by direct spinal infection or spread from other infected area. For evalu evaluation of the spinal infection, we have an uh, algorithm for, uh, which includes a lab test, complete uh, blood count, erythrocytes uh, and the rate, and C-reactive protein, blood pressure, and contiguron test for TB. And image studies, uh, spinal radiography, and uh, magnetic resonance imaging, and uh, computed tomography scan. Uh, finally, with biopsy CT scan guided or by open. For image studies, we can see uh, radiography not presented at the first time of the, at four weeks. We can't find nothing in uh, plain radiographic radiography. Most uh, diagnostic uh, radiographic imaging is uh, by MRI or computer tomography. And uh, if MRI is contraindicated, we can uh, use a radionucleated radio study. Biopsy. Biopsy is indicated if there is an absence of uh, positive blood culture. Biopsy site uh, uh, is from uh, uh, vertebral stimulitis or discitis is essential to identify the positive organism and guided the treatment. The biopsy idea should be performed before initiation of antibiotic. And if antibiotic is already given, it should discontinue for three days before the biopsy. Computer topographic guided biopsy. Uh, is better, uh, and if there is a, a failure to gain uh, in a two successive uh, culture, we can go for open uh, biopsy. A tissue sampling it should be sent for gram stain, acid fast stain, and aerobic and anaerobic culture, fungal and tuberculosis culture. Bacterial culture should be observed at least ten days to detect low virulence organisms. And TB culture should be should take weeks to grow. A surgical study also uh, be performed to detect uh, new plastic processes and to differentiate acute versus chronic infection. Our goal of treatment is early definitive diagnosis, eradication of infection, relief of axial pain, prevention of or reversal of neurological deficit, prevention of spinal deformity and preservation of spinal stability, correction of spinal deformity. In non-operative treatment of biogenic vertebral osteomyelitis is an antibiotic administration and treatment of underlying disease process, nutritional support, and the spinal immobilization with orthosis 
antibiotic selection should be based uh, on identification and sensitive, uh, sensitive testing according to biopsy or blood culture. Internal venous antibiotic uh, generally should be continued for six weeks, provided that satisfactory clinical result and reduction in ESR and CR active protein. The result of non-operative treatment is a complementary uh, uh, mortality rate resulting from a biogenic spinal infection range from 2 to 17%. And the uh, non-operative treatment is reported as successful uh, up to 75% of abnormality treated patient when criteria for success focus on infection cure, infection recurrence, and the uh, neurological status following treatment. The quality of life data suggested less favorable success rate with 31% of patients reporting unfavorable outcome and only 14% 14, 14 of patients free of pain following treatment. Which factor are suggested for successful outcome with non-operative treatment? The ideal patient for non-operative treatment is a neurologically intact patient, a minimal involvement of adjacent vertebra, necrotic deformity, and uh, there is no debilitating by systemic disease or immunosuppression. Uh, the most consistent predict, uh, predictor for success of non-operative treatment include patient younger age, younger age than uh, 16 years, and patients who are immunocompetent, infectious with the staphylococcus aureus, and decrease the ESR and C-reactive protein with treatment. On the other hand, the operative intervention is indicated either for open biopsy, failure of appropriate non-surgical treatment as documented by resistant elevation of ESR or C-reactive protein or refractory severe back pain, drainage of a clinically significant abscess or to treat neurological deficit due to spinal cord called equina or nerve compression, to treat progressive spinal instability secondary to extensive vertebral body destruction and correction of progressive or unacceptable spinal deformity. The goal of our surgical management is complete debridement of non-viable and infected tissue, decompression of a neural element, and long-term stability through fusion use of uh, autogenous graft material is a good standard. Our surgical approach is either anterior or posterior approach or a combination of uh, anterior and posterior approach. Uh, Laminectomy is a rarely advocated due to its dis destabilizing effect and associated with deformity progression, worsening spinal instability and neurological deterioration. The prognosis of uh, neurological recovery in a patient uh, with spinal infection, significant neurological recovery is observed in a patient with a mild neurological deficit or paralysis is done, uh, 36 hour duration, who underwent surgical intervention. Complete paralysis patient of greater than uh, 36 hours or 48 hours duration has not shown recovery with some exception for both disease. They show some uh, neurological improvement even after the long duration. The distress associated with individual abscess has been uh, reported as about uh, 12%. Now you are classified spinal infection of either two vertebral body infection, disc or spinal cord or meninges. Now we our uh, we will just discuss the vertebral body infection. This is a nice uh, picture of osteomyelitis, biogenic osteomyelitis, which uh, show uh, in MRI uh, section with the uh, disc involvement. This is uh, from a nice book, which uh, gold key in uh, spinal imaging by Dr. Yasser Zakaria uh, from Dumya uh, Cancer Institute. This is another picture for uh, tuberculosis spondylitis and so destruction of both the vertebra and the deformity. And this is brucellosis spondylitis. This is uh, about facet joint uh, arthritis. And this is for paraspinal abscess, which can be due from uh, TB infection with uh, deformity, kyphotic deformity. 
is about viral myelitis and HIV infection of the spinal cord. Spinal meningitis, Shilajakula and Sutsumiasis. Now I can start my case presentation. First case is a cervical infection, biogenic infection in uh, an 18 years old female single presented to our department complaining of the inability to move her upper and lower limbs about two weeks. The condition started gradually and uh, by increasing neck pain, progressive lower limb weakness, irrelevant past history, neurological examination revealed power in lower limbs, grade two and four plus in the upper limb, normal sensory examination. Lab test elevated the ESR, CRX protein and uh, WBC. Culture, blood culture was positive for staph aureus. And this is her CT scan image show destruction of C7 and uh, at uh, C6, C7 uh, vertebra with complete destruction of C7. This is a coronal view. And this is the MR view show and the uh, abscess collection with port compression. We are in the patient for anterior approach and decompression of the cord, uh, vertebral corpectomy and cylinder cage placement uh, and uh, plating and the uh, patient has a good recovery, most uh, operative with gradual improvement in neurological condition and uh, uh, continue for uh, antibiotics. And now it's uh, in a very fine condition. The second case is uh, TB infection, thoracic in a 24-year-old female single presented to our department with inability to move her lower limbs about two months. That condition started gradually, increased back pain, progressive lower limb weakness, small loss of sensation and complete loss of lower limb movement, vast history of chest TB before two years, neurological examination revealed bar in lower limb, one and normal in upper limb, normal symmetric control and normal sensory. One front test was Negative first, we underwent uh, posterior transventricular fixation and uh, spine, the spinal cord decompression with excellent improvement. Six months later, patient presented with decurrent back pain and lower limb weakness. That time, quantiform test was positive. In the first time, we suspected that the patient have a biogenic infection. We didn't think about uh, a uh, doing an anterior uh, corbectomy and uh, cylinder cage or uh, bone fusion. Uh, this is the before, before operation. Show spinal cord compression by abscess, complete destruction of the vertebral body and biogenic abscess, uh, sorry, uh, both uh, uh, abscess with cord compression. This is the first uh, quantiform test that was negative. This is the very operative CT scan. This is six months later, which he present again with the back, back bone and the lower limb weakness, show deformity uh, of the spine, uh, regardless of the instrumentation. And the uh, quantiform test was uh, a positive, we prepared again for uh, operation and decompression of the cord. This is the second quantiform test, which was positive, and we start antibiotic. This is both second operation with corbectomy and cylinder cage placement, wound fusion, and enlargement of the reconstruction. In follow up, uh, patient uh, was continued with antibiotic and covered also by. Uh, uh, routine antibiotic physiotherapy, neurological improvement with full recovery in six months. We have another uh, thoracic infection. This case is a very complicated case. Uh, 18 years uh, female patient presented to our department of instability, uh, inability to move her lower limbs about four months. The condition started gradually, back pain, and uh, then uh, loss of uh, lower limb weak, lower limb movement. Uh, loss of sensation and complete loss of low, lower limb movement. Vastus 3 also, she have uh, spinal TB, uh, chest TB. 
نيورجي خلق زي من نيفل ريديل باور ان ذا لور لمب 1 نورمال ابر لمب نورمال سيركيت كنترول ان نورمال سنسوري وي اندر وين ترانسبيتيكال فيكسيشن ان سبينال ديكومبريشن وذ اكسلنت امبروفمنت وان وير ليتر بريزنتد وذ ا سادن باك بين ان ديفورميتي وذ رود بريك داون اند بريش ذا سكين كونتيفرون از بوزيتيف ان ذا فيرست اوبريشن ذا سكند اوبريشن مالتي ريزيستنس تي بي was seen in the second culture. The second presentation, the, it was due to breaking of the reconstructs. We didn't do bone fusion and the, there is uh, no uh, uh, enforcement of the anterior uh, comb component of the vertebral body. Uh, so the, there was breakdown of the uh, uh, road with the key forces deformity and the uh, active uh, infection of the, of the spinal cord. This is uh, during the operative in the operating table in the survival position. As you see the kyphotic deformity here also, we are doing in the posterior lateral uh, approach for uh, the compression and the corbotomy and the inserting of uh, a cylinder uh, cage. Hardware failure and the resistant infection, they, they were the cause of uh, breakdown of the instrument and also uh, the operation we do uh, transventricular fixation with cylinder cage and beam fusion and correction of uh, key forces down. This is the post operative, the second operative operation with the cylinder cage inserted uh, after cobotomy and autologous bone grafting. Uh, reinforcement by four level up and four level down of transventricular screw. And follow up, the uh, patient was an antibiotic and uh, anti TB. Four months later, the patient had the CC plate uh, wound discharge, uh, treated as superficial infection and admitted for conservative treatment. Our final uh, case is an interesting case with the spinal hydratosis infection. Uh, in a 35 year old male, single presented to the department complaining of inability to move his lower limb for nine months. The condition started before two years, gradually increased back pain and progressive lower limb weakness. Soon he developed the hesitancy of micturation, alternation of sensation in both lower limb, which progressed to urinary incontinence, loss of sensation, and complete loss of lower limb movement. That's history of multiple surgeries for excision of multiple hydratis cysts from the liver and the right lung. Last one done before seven years. Neurological examination revealed spastic paraplegia with a grade A, sensory level B, below nibble. Uh, the superficial abdominal reflexes were absent and the plantar were extensor bilaterally and knee and jerk were exaggerated with bilateral ankle colonus. In the back, there was a soft uh, prominence uh, in the paramedian area by inspection. This is his uh, chest uh, CT scan, which show a multiple evidence area in the chest and uh, around the spine, which encourage our in the spinal canal. This is another picture. This is a sagittal view of a multiple. Spherical evidence region in the chest. And this is the coronal view, show the multiplicity of the chest and also spinal and paraspinal region. This is the MRI view, a coronal view, which show the multiple cysts in the chest and also which was compressing the spinal column and also invading the spinal cord and uh, compressing the spinal cord. Surgery, a patient prepared for operation in two stages, a teamwork with the thoracic surgeon first to start posterior laminectomy, cystectomy followed by thoracotomy to remove the intrathoracic multiple cyst. Patient was started at Bindazole, and operation was decompression, the spinal cord by laminectomy, cystectomy, and all cyst aspiration, injection of hypertonic saline, during operation, the cyst rupture, irrigation by hypertonic saline, multiple cyst evacuation, 
by segregation, by aspiration, and re-injection of hypertonic saline, aspiration against section of content. The second surgery by transfusion was holded because of an operable uh, condition as uh, described by the general surgeon or thoracic surgeon. In follow-up, after the first operation, the patient started to move his lower limb with about grade two in uh, six months. The patient suffered uh, step to surgical department, shifted to surgical department uh, 14 days later. Uh, the thoracic surgeon, as we said, he decided not to operate. Patients should come for physical therapy, albendazole, uh, 400 gram TDS for 28 days, recycle with 14 days interval between each days. This is the most operative CT scan. Two months post operative show a good compression of the spine with no cyst in the spinal canal. This is two month follow up of a patient. He is just walking. Uh, is uh, with the support of uh, with support and the power in the lower limb was grade three on both lower limb, but he's still incontinence for urine and stool. Our key point: spinal infection should be considered as a potential diagnosis when spa, when pain uh, and severe and unrelated uh, to activities. In general, antibiotic therapy should be withheld until pressure are obtained. In general, antibiotic therapy should be stopped before six weeks, not stopped before six weeks, and or until ESR or C-reactive protein normalized in order to decrease the recurrence of infection. Spinal discitis stimulitis is a disease process that predominantly affects the anterior spinal column, and surgical treatment must, must commonly require an anterior debridement and fusion. The amenectomy for disc space infected associated with vertebral stimulitis is associated with a very high complication rate. The disc is nearly always involved in biogenic vertebral infection. In contrast to granulomatous infection, typically do not involve the disc space, but should be ruled out, especially for TB, which have a typical picture in MRI. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor. John, do you want to say anything? <clears throat> okay, Alexander, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Alexandra Vodog, and I'm the Vice President for Dendi Romania. And today I'm going to introduce a very important speaker to us. His name is Dr. Serin Krachnaš. And also with this opportunity, I would like to thank John for hosting this amazing event. And also Neurosurgical TV, it is such a great honor to be hosted by you tonight. Uh, following my introduction for Dr. Krachnaš, He's a senior lecturer and neurosurgeon at Bagdazar Arsen Emergency Hospital in Bucharest, Romania, possessing a vast experience in the field of neurosurgery with an approximate number of 900 neurosurgical interventions per year, having mastered various surgical techniques for operating on the spine and spinal cord, from minimal invasive procedures for cervical or lumbar disc herniation to complex spinal stabilization for tumoral and traumatic pathologies. Without further uh, words, we would like to invite Dr. Krachnash to share his screen whenever you are ready, and we can wait to hear your presentation, and you can start whenever you are ready. Hello, good evening. It's a pleasure of being here. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm going to be short. First of uh, all, uh, I would like to uh, to say that uh, this uh, this presentation is made at uh, student level. I'm going to present a case. It's not about, um, uh, let's say, the, uh, the importance of the case from spine surgery perspective, but I would like to emphasize uh, the importance uh, of uh, preoperative planning for um, uh, for a successful surgery. Uh, I'm going to present uh, this case uh, has been operated uh, in um, just one sec, please. It's been operating in Toronto Western Hospital. I was not the leading surgeon here. The case was operated 10 years ago. I was there as a fellow in spine surgery in Toronto Western Hospital. 
but uh, I said that uh, this um, sec. this case is very um, il uh, illustrative uh, for um, how important it is, uh, is to make a good plan for surgery. So let's go forward. It's about uh, a gentleman, 46 years old. Uh, he came with uh, neck pain. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Kretsnach. Could you share your screen? Uh, sure, I did it. Just one sec. Unfortunately, I can't see your screen right now. If you try again. Yeah, okay, sure. Do you see now? Uh, no, I believe you have to enter on Zoom and press the green button with share screen. I already did it. Okay, and then you have to press on the screen and share. Section. You had it before, right? No, yeah, I think I don't have. No, just do it there before. Do you see anything now? Uh, yeah. Uh, do you see something now? Uh, I can mm -hmm. see your screen. Now it's fine now? Uh, no, I can no you're not screen sharing yet. Uh, you know where the screen screen sharing button is, right? Yeah. Okay, you gotta click click that first. You click share screen first. Okay. Step one. Okay, you please don't see that yet. Um the share screen. There you go. You're on no. your way. You're on your way. Okay. Great. I can see your screen now. Everything is fine now. No, you, see yeah. screen now? you see what we see. There we go. Perfect. Perfect. Oh, thank you. Okay. So I'm talking about this case. It's a 46 years old gentleman. Um, he came with um, a very intense neck pain, debilitating neck pain. Um, no neurological deficits. And uh, the investigations um, show this um, uh, C2 vertebral tumor uh, with uh, very slight uh, compression over uh, the spinal canal, but not a big deal. But however, the pain was uh, debilitating. And uh, uh, according to, let's say, our guess was that this, uh, the, we are talking about a spinal cordoma. And, um, uh, let's uh, remember just a little bit uh, uh, some uh, some characteristic of this tumor. So this is a slow growing uh, bone neoplasm. Uh, and what is important to emphasize is that uh, this tumor is refractory to conventional radiotherapy or chemotherapy. And uh, generally on block resection with wide or marginal margins is the treatment of choice for cordomas. Um, on short, uh, uh, if I'm going to operate a, a cordoma, a spinal cordoma, let's say, you need to take the, the whole tumor out. And uh, there are some, uh, the, the, the principle to, to, to operate this kind of tumor is, is very simple. Take the tumor out and then in spine, you, you need to stabilize the, the spinal column. And I'm going to, uh, to give you some examples. For example, here we're talking about a cervical cordoma. And uh, this is the post-operative surgery. Uh, the, you can see here that uh, the whole the tumor is, uh, is taken out, um, but you also need to, uh, to use something to stabilize the spinal column. So in this case, um, it was used uh, a, bone, um, a bone graft, uh, and uh, everything was reinforced with some instrumentation. Here's another uh, case, uh, an L4 uh, vertebral cordoma, and this is the post-operative uh, aspect. Uh, you can see here the, the, the tumor is, um, is gone and uh, the, the, uh, the spine is stabilized by using posterior and anterior instrumentation. So basically when you have a spinal cordoma, you need to take the tumor out and you use some screws and something bone or, or implants to, uh, to, uh, to stabilize the spinal column in a 360 degrees manner. Uh, by, by going back to our case, so in this case, what we need to do, just take the C2 out, 
uh, and um, and try to find uh, a way to to stabilize the the, the spinal column. But uh, there are two uh, challenges in this case. The first one is related to vertebral artery because you need to do something with it. It is in your way and you, you are not able to take the C2 out without to do anything with uh, something with this, with this artery. And the, second, uh, and the second challenge is related to the fact that on the top of, uh, of your construct, you don't have bone. So you don't have any chance to, uh, to, to put uh, uh, to, to, to insert uh, an implant or a bony graft uh, on, on superior uh, pole in, in, uh, in something related to, to the spine. So um, the, 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 the surgery was, was planned, uh, of course, uh, to be done by uh, both uh, approaches, posterior and anterior. The posterior approach had the aim to, to detach the tumor and to stabilize uh, in posterior the spine. So basically, uh, to detach the tumor, it is uh, enough to, to take uh, just the, the C2 posterior arch, and uh, this is it. But uh, what about the, the, the vertebral artery? Uh, if you are going back to, to, this, um, to this transverse section on the MRI, you can see that on the left side, the vertebral artery is, uh, is caught in tumor. It's, uh, it's invaded by, by tumor. So you can assume that uh, probably is not uh, as, uh, as competent as the other one. So uh, the, the plan was to, uh, to make a bypass on the, on the right side and uh, simply to ligaturate and to cut the, the, the left one. Uh, therefore, a vascular uh, surgery team uh, was brought into the operating room and uh, a saphenic uh, vein graft uh, has been obtained. And then um, it was used um, uh, another technique to, uh, to make the, the bypass for the, for the left vertebral artery. The other technique has a characteristic that it does not stop the, the, the flow, the, the blood flow into, into, the, uh, into the vest. And, uh, and then um, a posterior occipital cervical approach uh, has been performed. And the anterior approach has the aim to, to remove the tumor and to stabilize from anterior uh, the, the spinal cord. And going back to, uh, to the example that I gave you, uh, we, we can see that we need something to put uh, on the top. I mean, uh, the, the bony graft needs to be in, uh, inserted into a bony structure on, on the top. And going back to the anatomy, uh, we can see that uh, the most suitable for that is, is the clivus, um, which, uh, which was used in this, uh, in this uh, case. And the next question is, what kind of approach uh, do we need in this case? So by, by doing um, a high cervical approach, uh, we will be able to see um, only the C1, C2 area, but we don't, uh, we, we, we don't be able to, to access the clivus. By using a transoral approach, we can see the clivus C1, C2 area, but we, we are not able to, to reach C3, C4 area. So, uh, oral maxillofacial uh, team uh, came and uh, performed a transmandibular, translingual, transpharyngeal approach, which uh, gave us the possibility to, to, to reach from clivus to C4, exactly the, the targeted area. Okay, so from anterior approach, um, the, the anterior arch of C1 has been cut and then um, uh, the ligament, the, the, the ligament apparatus. Um, uh, of, of C2 uh, has also been cut. And at that point, uh, we will be able to, to take the tumor out and then the C2 out. And then what kind of, uh, uh, of graft uh, uh, we, we need to, to, to use in this case. And um, uh, finally, it has decided to be used a, fibular, a vascularized fibular graft. So um, an orthopedic surgeon's team came into the operating room and simply uh, uh, pre-elevated um, vascularized bone graft, fibular bone graft. And uh, then an ENT surgeons came and simply connected uh, the, um, 
the pedicle vascular, the, the vascular pedicle to the superior thyroid artery. And the, and the final uh, result is this one. So we can see here, uh, basically the patient has been beheaded. Now there's no any connection between head and, uh, and body. You can see here the posterior construct. We have uh, here the anterior construct by fibular graft, uh, which is reinforced by some screws and plates. Um, I've seen the patient six months following the surgery. He was uh, a bit stiff, uh, just a little bit discomfort over uh, his neck, but uh, basically he was, uh, he was in a very, very good shape. And uh, the final accounting of this, uh, of this surgery was 40 hours of surgery, 15.5 liter blood loss, and uh, five surgical teams of different specialty which has been involved. Um, and the message uh, by presenting this, uh, this case was that a successful surgery means good, good preoperative planning, appropriate technology, and no technical mistakes in surgery. I, would, I wouldn't say that this, uh, this kind of, of surgery is a spectacular one. I would say more than it's a regular one, but uh, with a very, very good plan. So um, this is, this is my, my opinion that there is no uh, any, any spectacle in surgery. Just plan, do what you need to do without mistakes and use the appropriate technology. Thank you, this is my conclusion. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Amara, are you there? Uh, can I ask you, Mr. Soroni, uh, Dr. Soroni, one question? Yes, yeah, sure. sure. About sure. Uh, the, the, uh, this is a very interesting case and very big case. Uh, uh, good, uh, good management for this case, but uh, I want. Uh, I wondering. About the intubation in such cases, do you, uh, what uh, technique do you use the trachea to me? Because the endotracheal or nasal uh, tube will uh, uh, be an obstacle for your approach. Yes, it was. It is a nasal intubation, right? Thank you. So, did, did you hear me? Did that answer your question? What is the what is the type of, of intubation for intratracheal intubation or uh, do you use the tracheostomy for this case? No. No, it what wasn't. Your... Hello? Yes. Yes, but what was the approach for anesthesia? It, it, it was an intubation. A nasal. Intubation. A nasal. Yes, it, it, intranasal. But by nose. Uh, by nose. Yeah. You have no obstacle during your uh, approach. I, but I can't hear you, sorry. And to the clitus and, the, and to the cervical spine, but good luck, but, good, uh, good job. Very nice case. Yeah, um, uh, Ahmed, can you uh, kind of translate? I think we're having a hard time understanding uh, due to the accent. Uh, Ahmed, do you know what the question is? I already understand, Mr. Jones. I asked him about the intratracheal intubation. That he said that it's uh, he do uh, endonasal intubation for such case. Okay, so, case. so he's answered the question. Yes. Okay, very yes. good. I'd like I'd like to introduce Ahmad Fawad Pirzad. He's a neurosurgeon from Afghanistan. He's the head of the uh, department, the, uh, the the society there. Uh, good day, Ahmad. Do you have any comments or questions for the presentation by uh, okay. Soren? Salam alaikum. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, nice presentation. We have a lot of cases uh, also, uh, metastatic and uh, infective, especially TB in Afghanistan as well. And uh, 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 in this case, uh, we also prepare not the tracheal intubation, it's good uh, for uh, doing uh, anesthesia. And uh, it was really difficult and uh, a great case. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you and welcome, Awan. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Jen. Okay, any more comments or questions from the panelists? Okay, I guess uh, we can move on, uh, Ahmed. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, there is someone asking about the complication. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. There is someone asking in the chat. Uh, okay. Uh, what the complication can face you during surgery? Can you hear that, Professor? No question for me. I think yes. it's for you. Go ahead, go ahead, repeat the question, Ahmed. We have another question. Go ahead. Yeah, it's in the chat that he is asking about what uh, the complication can face you during surgery. During this kind of surgery? Yeah, complications that you encounter during surgery. So, uh, from theoretical perspective, you can. Uh, Meet a lot of complications in this uh, in this kind of surgeries, but uh, in my, in this specific surgery, everything went absolutely um, perfect. You, you know, so without anything to, uh, uh, I mean, so what what was the plan was followed, and uh, that was all. You know. Okay, that is asked by Bas Mahmoud. I don't know if he's get what oh, he wants. See any more in the chat? No, no more. Okay, you can feel free for asking any question. Uh, I mean, all the attendees can ask what they want. Um, the chat, or they can speak. Do you, do you want? Okay, Maj, you want to move on? Okay, as you do. More questions? I, I believe not. Okay, I think there is no more question. What, okay. uh, look, uh, just a minute. Roxandra, do you want to say anything? Uh, no, I would like just to thank again all our uh, speakers and to thank again John for hosting this amazing event. Uh, is anyone, if anyone has to ask anything, you can do this now, or maybe you could contact the speakers through email. Okay, thank you. Nikolai, are you there? Yes, I'm here. <clears throat> do you want to speak? I want to thank all uh, of our speakers uh, for attending here and joining us and uh, using their time uh, to talk to us about uh, spinal surgery and uh, showing us that specialty. Uh, Mm, we hope that we will uh, have contact in further time and we will uh, collaborate on many new events. Sure. Okay, very good. Ahmed, do you want to move on? Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, I would like to hear uh, Jion, lastly. You and are there? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. And I appreciate the really like great lecture from every speakers. And in case of any questions, I guess they can contact them uh, via email. Yeah. 
Thank you for your time. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Madalena, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, uh, this oh, is Madalena. Um, I'm uh, from Deni, Romania. And uh, I just want to add some last few words by uh, taking the, uh, thanking the amazing Mikolaj Ahmed and June for this collaboration, because it was a real pleasure uh, for uh, organizing this event. Um, I want to take also um, John Bennett and your Surgical TV for hosting us and our wonderful, extremely um, talented and gifted uh, speakers and your surgeons that uh, talk for us, talk with us um, in this evening. It was um, a wonderful event and I just can't wait for the, the next collaborations because I'm sure they, they'll be uh, wonderful too. So thank you all. Thank you for participating at this, um, this event, at this uh, conversation and this evening and uh, We'll see you soon because we have a lot of surprises to, for you, a lot of events. Very good. Thank you. Uh, okay, Ahmed, any more presentations? Uh, no, thank you, John. I would like uh, again to uh, take this um, moment to thank uh, all the um, speakers. Uh, oh, okay. And uh, thank you a lot for you, John. You know, we can't do thing and we can't do anything without your support. So we are so appreciated for your support. And um, yeah, uh, inshallah, after a few weeks, we will do another webinar. And uh, inshallah, it will be so amazing like this. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Okay, Ahmed, uh, everyone have a great day. You know, these conferences uh, are great when they're interactive, like we had today. Uh, and I think we're going to find they get more valuable because uh, I feel that we need to, uh, myself included, need to learn how to use Zoom better, uh, more effectively, uh, because it's going to be around. Uh, get used to this platform. It's going to be around. Uh, and the iterations will improve. It'll improve with the new technologies of uh of uh, digital, digi all the digital tech, it'll improve. This will be the way that we learn uh, things like virtual reality and uh, other platforms. Most doctors don't have time to go to the conferences on virtuality and artificial intelligence. However, they will have time to do a Zoom on artificial intelligence because that's a science you know that's gonna be around. It's gonna be, it's effective and it works. So Zoom is a key. So I thank you very much. Thank you very much, the whole organization. And Dr. Adnan, Jayun Hur, and, uh, and uh, thanks. Nicole, thank you very much. Salam, thanks, Professor John and Ahmad, Professor Adnan. And uh, if you like, uh, I also contribute uh, our experience from Afghanistan with limited resources in your next webinars. Uh, I can contribute uh, as well. Thank you, Professor Jonas. Yes. We look, we look forward to that. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. You Salam. can stay here. You can stay here. Now, this, now this platform is good for networking. In other words, it's good to meet neurosurgeons. And neurosurgeons will tell you that it's, it helps you to meet other neurosurgeons. It's going to help your career. I mean, this is your career you're talking about. This is not a game. This is a career uh, that you want to improve on uh, and that you want to utilize to the best way. I'm sorry to keep going about this, but uh, it's important. Yes, and I think you. we'll have Ed and we'll have Ed, we'll have uh, uh, we'll have Ahmad from Afghanistan. I'm trying to get him to do a grand yes, round. Yes, uh, we are interesting uh, to having uh, Dr. Ahmad with us. And uh, any uh, webinar we, uh, next time or for private conversation, uh, I will send you my email and you are more than welcome uh, in any topics. Yes, okay. yes. We, okay. Yeah. Okay. Any okay. ideas? Any ideas you have, we're welcome. Uh, this, is, this is your education, your platform. So, okay, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, John.
Thank you very much. Bye. Have a nice day.